My name is Mariana Grossman. I'm Executive Director of Sustainable Silicon Valley and thrilled to be moderating the panel on social networking for energy. And we've heard that theme come up a number of times today in, in other sessions. We're really lucky to have an outstanding panel. I'll introduce them in a, in a moment. One of the, the things that seems to be happening in the energy industry is, is really integration with information technology and communications. And social media is a really important part of that. So as people start to um, have more access to energy information and the companies have more access to what people are doing, there's an opportunity for uh, giving people feedback and engaging people and, and using, um, using this information differently than we ever have before. It also raises all kinds of exciting interests, uh, issues about privacy and, and, um, and policy and, and their opportunities for uh, things that we could be doing that maybe regulations may be inhibiting or there maybe regulations should be inhibiting. And what, that's one of the things we'll be talking about is, is um, how, do people own their own data? Do they, um, who, who, who's in charge of that? And uh, what is it for? And, and how do we use it to accomplish the goals of having energy be used to support better lifestyles with more efficiency and, uh, and more fun? So I would like to introduce our, our panelists, and then they're going to each have a few minutes to talk, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation among the panel, and then we'll open it up to the, to the floor. So on my left is Andy Campbell from, Ten sorry, from Tendril Energy, and, or Tendril.com, and Zeke Hausfather from C3 Energy, and Marcy Scott Lynn from Facebook, and she'll be talking about their use of OPower, which was mentioned in the previous panel here as an investment of, of Trey and, and KPCB. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Go, okay. Andy. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for having Tendril at, at this event. It's been a stimulating past few sessions. I'm going to make a few framing remarks uh, around social media and energy, kind of some remarks about what that means to Tendril, as well as provide some examples of, of some, some social, social media and energy that we've, we've been involved with, some of the projects that we have going on. First, just briefly, who is Tendril? So we're a software company. We're focused on providing insight and control to residential electric and gas consumers. And we do that by partnering with, with energy service providers, utilities being a, a prime category of those, um, as well as with other companies, appliance manufacturers, other types of companies that want to have a relationship with consumers related to energy. We're based in Boulder, Col Colorado. We have several other offices. I'm based here in the Bay Area. We also have uh, folks in Amsterdam and in Melbourne, Australia. And one element of, of what we do, there's there's really two, two big pieces in terms of the applications that our products, that our services offer. One, which I'm not going to talk about so much, is really control, kind of this, this concept which came up in the last session in this room around um, um, sort of beyond the, beyond the electric meter, the control of devices within the home, um, the concept of smart appliances, smart thermostats, I mean, Nest Lab being a, a prime example of a, of a smart thermostat. Um, another element of what we do, which we see is really critical to bring consumers into this sort of thinking about energy is, a, is we have a behavioral web portal. And that's based on concepts of real behavioral, behavioral mechanisms, um, goal setting, driving people to action, and providing regular feedback to consumers around that. Then thinking about sort of what's social, we think about social media broadly. Um, and certainly in the energy context, you should think about it broadly. So the, the kind of web 2.0 sharing world that we're in now, there's uh, examples of social media certainly include um, things like Facebook, Wikipedia, YouTube, which are very active, very interactive forms of social media. But equally social or also social are other things where there's user generated content. So think of, of Amazon or Netflix where, where users are, are typing in um, reviews and, and things like that. So there's an, an interaction going on there that's maybe a bit more static than what you might have on, say, a Facebook interaction, but there's, it still is social and it still is, and it's, importantly, it's consumer-driven content. When we think of it, there's a, there's a, a one, nine, one nine ninety rule of interaction around social media online. So the 1% of people are heavy contributors, and you may have 
If you're on Facebook, you may have some of these friends who like, it seems like oh, they're constantly posting something. Um, you wonder you know, what else they do with their time. And then there's the 9% occasional contributors. Um, so now and then you may post a, a review of, a, of something on Yelp or, or something else. But then 90% of people are, are really readers. And I think an important point, if thinking about yourself, and, and I'll say I, I don't really consider myself as a heavy user of social media, but I do use social media quite a bit in this last, last category of readers. I you know, sort of lurk around and read about my friends on, on Facebook. Or a, another prime example, which I think is very relevant to energy, is often if I have, say, an IT problem, a problem with my computer, the first thing I'll do before, if it's a, you know, my work computer, before I call the IT department even, is I'll do a quick Google search and type in the problem I'm having. And, and chances are what will pop up are a number of message boards, um, places where people have had the same problem I have had. I'll read through that. Very often, I'll find a solution to that problem. And I, I'm not actually really necessarily adding anything to the conversation, but, but it was a very much a, a, a social interaction between, in this case, other people that ended up helping me um, solve a problem that I would have had trouble solving or would have taken longer to solve otherwise. Then this is my, my last slide talking a little bit about some examples from projects that we've been involved with. So we, you know, we think a very key part of engaging consumers around energy is, is uh, the idea of comparison, collaboration, and competition. So one particular project which I'll mention, we have a, a project in Cape Cod where there's a small, a, uh, we call it municipal aggregation type of energy service provider there, and they offer our web portal to their consumers. And, and there's two elements of the, of the social piece of that that are very important. One, there's this, this concept we have called ask an expert, and that's where we have sort of these expert users that we seed the discussion with. So someone, in this case, these are consumers that have access to very granular data from their, their meters. They have smart meters, and they actually have continuous instantaneous information about what's happening in their home. And this is totally new information for, for most people. So it's not uncommon on this message board is, is someone will say, you know, what is this strange spike going on you know, at, at, at 8 a.m.? And they'll just post a, a question, a you know, query onto the board. And some of the ask these experts, who initially in this early stage are often employees of ours, will come on with their expertise and say, well, you know, it's probably you know, your, it's, uh, one I was reading was, was something pretty, pretty obscure that I never would have thought of, but people who live on hills often have pumps that, that pump out, um, have to pump up the sewage up the hill, and apparently that causes some very unusual spikes in electricity usage. Um, you know, when you have a very localized social network, you can actually hone in on some very localized causes like that. And then an another example is, is the, someone had some questions about, they were experimenting with some, um, some, some dimmable CFL lights, they had problems with that. They posted online, hey, this isn't really working for me. Anyone else have experiences? Then other people came in and said, well, yeah, I've actually you know, had some similar problems or I've, I've, I've started adopting some LED lights that solved this problem. And so people actually found solutions which satisfied a need they had and also, um, in this case, saved energy for them too. So I'll pass it on from here. Okay, thanks. In a while since I've worked One on of the PC. things I did, decided was to save a little time and not do long introductions because there are good bios in the book. So if you want to know, and each of our speakers also has public sector and private sector background, which I think is a pretty interesting combination. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Zeke Hausfather uh, from C3, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how to engage customers around energy efficiency. Um, because one of the single biggest problems we run into is simply gaining mind share, making people care enough about energy to take the time and effort to take action and to realize meaningful mm -hmm. savings. Um, before I dive into that, let me give a, a really brief introduction to C3 as a company. Uh, so C3 was started in 2009 by Tom Siebel of Siebel Systems fame. Uh, they primarily started as a large commercial and industrial energy management company. Um, they later moved on to small and medium business. Uh, I actually helped co-found a company called Efficiency 2.0 that was purchased uh, a little over a month ago now by C3. Uh, we primarily started in the residential space um, and did a bit of small and medium business as well. 
Uh, and together, we sort of cover the entire utility stack, providing energy efficiency services uh, to utility companies, uh, large commercial, industrial, and small to medium business, like at PG&E here in California, as well as residential, uh, for example, Southern California Edison here in California. Um, and one of the biggest challenges in, in motivating customers to save energy is, as I mentioned, this mindshare issue. Uh, and it's really hard to gain mindshare, especially on the residential level. For commercial and industrial and small and medium business, at least the, the more medium side of small and medium business, they tend to be more rational actors. If you give them a, a reasonable return on investment and access to capital, most of them will convert on energy uh, efficiency behaviors. Residential is a lot harder. Um, there's been a lot of studies about why residential customers don't necessarily convert. And if you look at sort of empirical uh, studies of, of purchasing behavior, uh, residential customers will, will have up to 40% discount rate on energy efficiency investments, which is huge compared to most other areas of their life. Um, and there's a couple different barriers that have to be overcome uh, to get residential customers really engaged and really saving energy. Uh, the first is, is simply information. Information is an important part of the solution. It's not the entire solution, but it is an important part. There's a really interesting uh, study uh, last year in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, actually, that looked at what people perceive the energy savings are from common home energy saving actions and, and what they actually are. And people tended to get the small things right. They, they got around ballpark estimates for things like CFLs, uh, programmable, well, a little bit less so for programmable thermostats, but when you get into the larger energy saving things, you know, replacing furnaces, uh, air sealing, uh, high efficient air conditioners, they're really far off, and, and usually they thought they saved a lot less than they actually did. Uh, so information is big, and, and an important part of information is specific targeting of information to individual customers. What's going to be right for a home in Maine and home in Florida is going to be completely different. Uh, and even within a particular utility service territory, what's going to be right for an apartment in LA and a larger house in the suburbs is going to be completely different. Thankfully, there's a lot of different data sources that are out there, most of them publicly available, that can be combined with billing information to get a really accurate estimate of how a particular home uses energy with really minimal inputs from that particular user. The last thing we want to do as part of an interactive website is ask someone a 30-question form about their home. We're going to lose 99% of them right there. So by pulling things like parcel level property records from county tax assessment offices, where we can get the square footage of a home, the year it was built, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, if they have an attic or a basement, if they have a pool, exterior surface material, uh, space heating fuel, the cooling equipment type in some cases, uh, pulling in their interval usage data from our utility partners, pulling in hourly temperature data from thousands of weather stations, uh, pulling in a whole bunch of these really high resolution data. We can, get, we can estimate how a home uses energy, and more importantly, we can look for unusual patterns and outliers. So for example, we can look at a particular neighborhood and find out the elasticity of cooling use. So how much one additional degree hour causes an increase in cooling use for each home in that neighborhood. We can normalize it per square foot. We can look within certain brackets of square uh, feet. And we can figure out who are the outliers. And we can message them around that. We can say, hey, Jim, we noticed last summer you used about 20% more energy for cooling than similar homes in your neighborhood. Here's three simple ways for you to save on cooling energy this summer. That sort of targeting, which is really allowed by these property records, by this interval data, is really effective in converting people into action because you're giving them timely and actionable recommendations that they can take. You're not just giving them a generic list of tips. So this type of information can be put together in a number of useful ways to do analytics, uh, to leverage all this data, and ultimately provide the customer with targeted and actionable recommendations that are gonna be best for their home. Now, for the five to 10% of people who really wanna dive in, we can allow them to further refine that information, either replacing the defaults that we provided or diving down into any individual action. You know, they want to install a low flow shower head, they can tell us what the flow rate of their current shower head is. We can, we'll even give them an instructional video of how to do it by measuring their shower flow rate in a bucket. Now, most people won't do that, but there's 5% or so of folks who really want to dive down to that sort of level. Um, and we also empower people both through information and also through other behavioral techniques. And one of the ones we employ is rewards. One of the biggest challenges in the US around energy efficiency is energy is too cheap. If you're working in somewhere like Arkansas and the marginal rate is five cents a kilowatt hour, it's gonna be really hard to convert people in energy use. So we've done a lot with reward systems with both local and national merchants. Um, we've also done a lot with regular feedback. So whenever bills come in on a monthly basis, telling people how much reward prints they, got, or they have, what they can redeem them for, giving them additional targeted tips. Uh, we've done a lot of work with lotteries so this was a great promotion we did uh, in ComEd, uh, Chicago area, where one in 20 people who signed up got a free summer of electricity, which sounds like it would be expensive, but actually gives a very reasonable uh, sort of cost per acquisition to the web program. Um, and then I'm running out of time, so I'll skip over a few things. Uh, and finally, targeting is really important. 
the demographics of an individual segment of customers is going to affect their energy just a lot. Um, and we want to be able to buy up information about the magazines people purchase, about their political affiliations, about their various demographics, not to show them and not to scare them, because frankly, some of that is, is kind of creepy that all that's out there, but to target them with the right messaging. Are they someone who's going to care about carbon? Are they someone who's going to care about saving money? Are they someone who's going to care about a rewards program? And we find some really interesting stuff through our research. This is one of the cooler ones we found in a program uh, that folks who uh, were, were dieters um, were much less likely to save over time than folks who are not dieters. So 3 to 4% savings versus 10 to 12% savings. Similarly, people at a really high loans relative to the value of their home were also much less likely to save in, save in around the same rate, range. So putting all this data together, using it to intelligently target uh, residential customers and giving them sort of the motivations and rewards that are going to best fit their particular profile is, from what we can see, the best way to get traction and, and get real savings. Thank you. Oh, I just use this one? Okay. Um, hi, so I'm not, I'm here from the social side of the social plus energy, um, as opposed to from the energy side. And I, so I'll talk a little bit about why Facebook uh, is interested in this, like how we got into this. And then it, mostly I want to just talk about what we're doing, you know, that relates to this conversation. Um, as a company, we're pretty laser focused on our own energy efficiency, specifically where it matters the most for us, which is in our data centers. And probably about a year ago, we, it, it kind of dawned on us that um, for, for everything that we'll do in terms of efficiency and the sustainability of our own operations and our data centers, we have these 900 plus million people on our platform that if we could just activate them on some of these issues, the power of that dwarfs anything we would do ourselves. And so we, we really started honing in on this idea of how do we add social solutions to some of society's biggest challenges. And, and specifically, we were thinking about energy efficiency. It's something big for us. It's um, not something, as Zeke was saying, it's not something that consumers think about a lot. In fact, uh, after we started meeting with Opower, they told us the average consumer thinks about their energy use for six minutes a year. And so, you know, one of, one of the things we wanted to do was to get people thinking more about that. And so we partnered up with um, Opower and NRDC and Facebook for us to be the platform for making what Opower already does and uh, social. And, and our inspiration for this was um, the... Uh, Oh, what was, I'm, I'm totally blanking on the name. In the 80s, this project that NRDC did about energy efficiency in, um, in Oregon, and they were trying to figure out how to get people to, uh, to have, uh, make more energy efficient choices. And they were, they were planning on doing this whole program with billboards, et cetera, and what they learned was that the most effective way to get people to change their energy behavior was word of mouth, neighbor to neighbor. And so this was really inspiring for us because, you know, Facebook is modern day word of mouth. And so, so we teamed up, the three of us, to create what we call the social energy app. I'm sure everyone in this room, because you're energy enthusiasts, knows what I'm talking about or has signed up. Um, if not, I hope by the end of this, you go straight to your Facebook account, which I'm sure all of you have, and you do sign up for it. So I'm just going to show you some screenshots and talk a little bit about what it is. Um, so, as I said, our, our goal, you know, our basic goal was to get, was to spark a conversation about energy efficiency. We, you know, I think over the longer term, we have a lot of goals about behavior change and, you know, actual savings and, and environmental impact. But, you know, our, our most basic goal was to just spark a conversation, which is something that Facebook does really well. So, we worked with Opower and NRDC and Opower worked with their utility customers to enable people to log in to Opower 
with their Facebook account and actually be able to connect directly to your utility. So you sign in this way, you, you, you can also sign in without Facebook and you also don't have to connect directly to your utility if your utility isn't part of this um, network. We have, I think, uh, 17 utilities right now which covers about 21 million households in, uh, in the US. So you log in with Facebook and you enter your, you can connect directly for, in my case it's PG&E, ComEd is one of the options. You connect directly with your utility and the first thing you'll see is this comparison. So um, what your use, it's kilowatt hours right now. We're, we're not, um, natural gas isn't there yet and I think longer term O-Power is looking to add things like water and things like that. But for right now it's just electricity. So you see your use, you see similar homes, in your area and then you see like what's considered efficient. So this person is amazing. Um, and then you get little messages about, you know, like good job and an opportunity to make it social, Put, share it to your Facebook page. And actually we, uh, Opower recently introduced some actions so that this share to Facebook is, can now be more automatic. So you can log in and it can share to Facebook that you are checking your energy use for the month of May or whatever it is. And so then another option is that, you, you know, so presumably you have friends in here, your friends have signed up. When you sign up, you get the option to invite your friends to join. And then you can see how you and your friends stack up against each other in any given month, um, which goes to the point about competition and comparison and the things that are going to hopefully motivate people. And then, and so this really gets to the heart of like what we, what we were really interested in at, at the start, which is to drive conversations that might otherwise not be happening. So these are some examples of you know, really early users you know, posting things to Facebook and, and people commenting. Um, I have my own example of this, which is my old apartment was really poorly insulated and I was cold all the time. And, and we had our heat on so many hours of the day. It's like embarrassing. I'm not even gonna tell you what, what it was. But um, so we finally bought a heated mattress pad and we're able to lower our heat several, like a number of degrees. And, it, and I couldn't believe the difference in my bill. And so I posted something to Facebook show, you know, showing my usage and I said something like, you know, thanks, thanks heated mattress pad and, and had like 10 or 15 comments and we had a whole conversation. Oh, where'd you get your heated mattress pad? I didn't know you could do that. And, and that's the kind of thing that we are hoping to spark is like these initial conversations get people thinking more than those six minutes and, and then eventually taking action. And then down the line, you know, our, th this is the taking action piece and the hopes to drive behavior change. So within the app, you can compare, you can, um, you know, get your own data, compare to your friends, et cetera, and then you can learn about what are some things that you can do, whether it's, you know, the CFL, you know, it's everything from changing out your light bulbs to buying more energy efficient appliances, um, et cetera. So we're pretty excited about, um, we're pretty excited about the potential. We launched, I think, eight or nine weeks ago. We're seeing like pretty good adoption. It's slow, we keep adding new features. We're trying to really get the utility companies to engage with their customers, to get people to, sign up and I, you know, we're going to plan, there's a whole evaluation piece that we're, we're actually partnering. The Precourt Center is part of, at some point, like going to look into evaluation and measurement and um, yeah, we're, we're really hopeful and excited about the potential for this. Oh. Thank you. I have a, a couple of questions for you. One is what do you think, and I, for each of you to answer this, what do you think motivates people to want to save energy? Is it for money, for uh, climate change, for energy security, some of those themes that have come up today in the conference? Yeah, I mean, our view is that people are different. And you know, we've done our own kind of uh, customer segmentation exercise, and we broke that down into be four categories. You could break it down different ways, but some people are motivated by green. Some people are motivated by wanting to seem green, which is different. They'll be more likely, maybe not the early adopters, but the fast followers. Um, others motivated by money. Some people are just very skeptical, and you have to think about different ways to engage them. So I think people are diverse. That's what's great about social media as opposed to maybe a more traditional top-down, say a utility or one, you know, one company that's trying to do mass media, is they're going to miss you know, 95% of customers because everyone's, 
everyone has different things that, that are, they're going to respond to. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, I, I agree with you. And, and I think we're all going to agree that you know, there is no one size fits all solution for messaging. Um, and, I, and I think it is really important to be able to target people effectively with the messaging that will work for them. And a big part of that is testing. You know, you're going to get it wrong a lot, but you want to be able to, to run all of your experiments as A-B tests to see what messaging works for which group of people. Do you get more people enrolled in a program with normative comparisons or rewards? Do you get more people with a carbon-related focus if they have this demographic than that demographic versus a savings versus a rewards? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that, and, and we've been trying to do a lot of it, um, though, though we're not perfect. Um, to really be able to, because we're dealing with a very limited timeshare here, and, and often you know, we either get people or we don't. And so we really need to be aware that our first contact with them is very important, and we need to tailor that message as much as possible to, to what we think is going to work best. Yeah, I think, I think from our point of view, what's so interesting about what we're trying to do and using Facebook to do it is that what peop it's not as much people caring about energy efficiency, it's people caring about their friends and what their friends are doing and what their friends are talking about, and people being able to learn from what their friends are doing and sharing and, and talking about and discover things that way. So it might actually be that you're not a person who thinks you care at all about energy efficiency, but you know, your friend Sarah posted something about looking at her energy use and now that looks cool, it's a cool icon and people are talking about it and so now you're gonna go check it out. So I think it's, it's less about what's motivating you specifically on energy efficiency and just this ability to um, have friends sharing information and motivating each other to discover new things on Facebook and, and this being one of those things. I recently learned something about the difference between rewards and making things into a game, or I guess there's a new verb, ga or gamification. And the features of a game are that you opt in, that it's fun, that it's challenging, that, you, that there's variety, that you get new skills, you get re motivation, uh, recognition, and mastery, and rewards. So it's not just rewards. And I'm wondering, to the extent you're experimenting with gamification versus just pure rewards, and then also, uh, sometimes with the energy savings, the savings themselves aren't really that much for most people's budget, depending, at least in California, that's often the case. And, uh, but if they could give the surplus savings to a school or some charity they care about, that might be, or their church or something, that might be an additional kind of reward. So I'm just wondering, kind of what are you experimenting with with respect to either making things like a game or uh, in, in experimenting with reward systems? Um, well, first I want to say gamification is hard. <laughs> There's been a lot of folks out there who have tried to make energy games that are compelling, and, and they've, by and large, with a couple exceptions, been abysmal failures. Um, there are aspects of gamification that you can include. One thing that we've experimented with, for example, is rewarding people for behavioral streaks. So if you reduce your energy use relative to your own benchmark or a, a neighbor uh, comparison benchmark five days in a row, you get a, a bonus. Stuff like that, small little things to keep people engaged and going back. But overall, it's, it's difficult to include that many elements of gamification and make it work well. It's, it's something we're, we're always trying to work toward, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit leery of tossing out the term too much. But the second thing you mentioned is, is actually really interesting, and this is allowing people to contribute rewards back to charities, back to their local schools. And I'd add to that a, a third thing, which is allowing people to get energy efficient products as rewards, so you sort of have a virtuous cycle. And, and we've had some positive experience with that, and it's, it's something that, that we definitely like to pursue. Yeah, I mean, so just the way that we're looking at it for the app that um, Opower is developing is intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. So the intrinsic being the, like, I'm king of the mountain, or just these kind of badges that you get when you make certain achievements, and that's just going to be, like, I'm motivated by being able to post this to my profile, show everybody that I've achieved something, and then the extrinsic piece, which would be rewards, whether it be from the utility company or um, other kinds of partners that are interested in participating. We haven't built that part out yet, but I know that, um, that like the, the intrinsic piece is coming pretty soon for the app, and the extrinsic piece is, is on the roadmap. We, um, so it's, uh, we think it's an important piece of it. And then one more question before we open it to the audience. Um, what do you think is the right balance between privacy and, and uh, kind of giving people enough information to, to make a difference? I, I think some, we heard some, some things about the kind of insight people have, you know, are you home or not? Um, what are your uses of energy, that sort of thing. So I think we'll start with Andy. Yeah, from, from our standpoint, it's a very important issue. And the key is that, that a consumer has control over their own data. And even that is not in the utility, in the energy space. It's not um, 
broadly accepted or implemented. I mean, most people do not have access to their own energy usage data. Many people, if you live here in Northern California or other places, you have a smart meter, which is recording tremendous detail about how you use energy, but you don't have access to any of that data. Um, so first piece of it is, is just getting established, and we view it through as being a legislative regulatory issue that consumers have the right to get access to their own data, and preferably in a, in a standardized machine-readable format so that that information can be made useful, not just sort of looked at as a graph or something. Um, and the privacy element of that is important too, but really, I guess our view is consumers need to be able to control that themselves. If people have different preferences around privacy. Um, certainly companies need to, uh, to you know, take a very cautious view toward privacy and, and you know, we believe in informed consent is a basic sort of standard that we're not gonna pass data to someone else unless the consumer has consented and they understand what they're consenting to do. But then once a consumer has the data, or, or we believe consumers should have the freedom to really um, put it all out there if they want to or to keep it very private. Yeah, I mean, privacy is critical. Uh, the last thing we want is, is some big, you know, data hacking incident to undermine sort of people's faith and the ability of third parties to, to regulate or to manage uh, this sort of data. Um, and I think by and large the PUCs have done a reasonable good job, it varies a bit state by state, in establishing fairly strict standards for utilities in terms of, of providing data to third parties. Uh, for some of the other data that's out there, stuff like Axiom, data, property records, uh, that stuff can be useful, but from our experience, it should never really be displayed to the customer. Um, the last thing we want to do is scare people by saying, hey, we just found all this stuff out about you. Uh, a lot of that can happen under the hood. It can be used to drive targeted useful analytics, but all the customer should really see is the end result, the, the targeted actionable message for that customer, not all the information that goes under it. Um, that said, they should see their bills, of course. Yeah. I mean, so in this context, the, the way the privacy issue applies to Facebook is in terms of what you share to Facebook because the way the app is designed, you log in with your Facebook account, but all of your data lives on Opower's servers. So Facebook has no insight into anything about your energy use or anything. So um, the issue is more about being clear and giving um, people the, the options to share or not share to control how much or how little information actually gets posted onto their Facebook timeline which you know, is um, entirely up to the user. We have inline privacy controls and, and all of that. So, um, but in terms of that kind of privacy about your, your data around your usage and stuff, that, that all is on Opower servers and it, they're not here to talk about it, so. Great. Questions from the audience? And just please raise your hand when you get the microphone. Introduce yourself, your name, and, and the question. Ben over here. Ben Meita, a uh, question to C3 gentlemen. Uh, mm -hmm. Where is the maximum potential for saving energy at the lowest cost? Is it industrial sector, residential sector, or commercial sector? So I would actually argue that at this point, it's probably concentrated in both small and medium businesses and residential. A lot of the lowest hanging fruit has been picked for medium and large CNI. There's a lot of really good ESCOs out there and, and energy management companies that have done a good job historically. I mean, there's still a long way to go. I don't want to make it sound like it's solved, but the real low hanging fruit is, is in residential and small commercial. And one of the big challenges there is getting the regulatory frameworks right so we can run the sorts of behavior-based programs that we do that, that Opower and Tendril have been working on that really can, they're not device specific. It's not, you know, we're gonna give you a $50 rebate for this widget. It's allowing people to do multiple actions in their homes to reduce energy use and figuring out a way to, to or having regulatory acceptance of methods to verify those savings. And, and we've really seen much lower costs than traditional utility programs through those sort of measures. Could you give an example of a regulatory barrier that gets in the way of that? Uh, sure. So traditionally, energy efficiency programs have largely been done through deemed savings. Um, through, so sorry, slow down a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> traditionally, a utility, or utility evaluation has primarily been done through deemed savings. You install five air conditioners, you get this much energy savings per air conditioner you install. Moving away from that towards sort of a whole home analysis, actually looking at how people's bills change over time, uh, has been a bit of a transition. And California has really led the way in acceptance of these sort of protocols, both for a fully randomized experimental design, like what Opower does for its mailers, and quasi-experimental design, where you have people opting into the program and you have to control for self-selection bias. Uh, and there's been a lot of really good stuff happening, especially in California on that front over the last year or two. I've seen that's also happening with things like street lights, where you actually are metering the actual Thing, instead of saying a street light typically does this, if you 
have a, a smart street light that can dim or you know react to moonlight or sense the presence of people, that sort of thing. Great. Another question. It's right here. Okay. And, oh, you have the mic already. So you first, yeah. and then you. Okay. Please stand up so we can see you and sure. introduce I'm, yourself. I'm Benoît Delabro. I am uh, the CEO of uh, a new company that is. Uh, uh, I call myself an energy coach, and we are uh, working uh, um, for the residential market. So we are energy coach going out in, um, in very specific um, um, residential areas in the Silicon Valley, where all these big mansions are uh, built. So we, we are aiming at very, very high user in electricity, and we are giving um, very specifics, uh, and we are doing actually the retrofits for them. You know, that, and we are speaking about LED retrofits. We are speaking about power smart, um, smart, meet, smart uh, power strips, stuff like that. So I have, I have actually one problem: is my customers are very, very interested in comparing their data to their neighbors. Am I doing well or not? So we are doing. We are using Opower, we are using Facebook Opower application. And the, match, the, the data that are published on this, um, right now on this site are very, very difficult to compare because this is raw data. And I, I, um, it's kilowatts, kilowatts hour per month. And it doesn't mean anything, of course, because you are comparing houses that are different in size some, some of my customers are using electric cars, some are not. Uh, some are using ACs, some are not. Do you have a question? So please? the question is, how can we standardize this data for the customer, for the users, to be able to compare, really, what are their energy okay. intensity? Great. Andy? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of effort in that area. There's, there's something known as the Green Button, which is a new initiative that was launched by the White House Chief Technology Officer. And the Green Button is basically a standardized form uh, for energy usage data. It was initially targeted at the sort of smart meter type data. And it's in a, a form that, because it's standardized, every utility that implements this standard will implement it in the same way. Then an application developer can have an expectation that they can develop a nationwide um, application. And it, you know, the challenge of it, though, is it, it's a voluntary initiative. Utilities have to decide for some reason, whatever their motivation is, that it's something that they want to make available. The California utilities have. Um, you know, most utilities have not. And, um, and so it's a continued challenge, is just getting that data, getting it in a standardized form. Um, especially just in the monopoly-dominated market where the monopolies don't necessarily see it as in their interest to, to enable access to that data. You want to add to that, Steve? Uh, just really quick. W one thing that might be useful for you to look into is, is, again, integrating with something like Green Button. And as you do these coaching for different homes, you'll build up a database of, of home characteristics and energy use data you can use to do your own benchmarking. I mean, the challenge is without... Uh, the data that, that someone like us or Opower has, which in many cases is the usage for everyone and the, for the entire utility, it's really hard to do those sort of benchmarks. Uh, so I'd, I'd suggest trying to build your own database and, and work from there. Marcy, did you want to? Okay. Next question, please. Oh, thank you, Maria. Oh, just hold it right up to your mouth. They'll turn it on for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Just right uh, up there. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Marcia for this heated pad, Major's pad. Thank you for sharing this oh. information. <laughs> yeah, and I actually have the question to you. Uh, it has two sides. One thing, why do you think that people will be interested in sharing their utility, uh, electricity power spending uh, on Facebook? It's one part of the question. And another part, what are the key expectations from the utilities who are participating in their all power? So I think in terms of why we think people will be interested, it's more people do a lot of stuff on Facebook that, um, that to, to discover. People are always interested in discovering th things that their friends are interested, things that people that they know are connected to are doing on Facebook. So um, there, at no point by using this app do you publish your, um, you can choose to publish your actual numbers 
the dollar amount, et cetera. That's not actually part of the flow. It's more about posting that you're looking at it. We're going to get to a point pretty soon where when you um, look for tips and tricks on how to save that you post that. So I think part of why people are interested is just to people like to be who they are on Facebook. And if it's something that you're doing and that you're making a part of your life, you want to tell people about it. And then other people say, oh, you know, you're spending time doing that. I'm going to check that out. And then they, you know, they're either interested or they're not. Um, so in terms of why we think people will be interested, people like to share. <laughs> people just like to share their authentic selves on Facebook. And so when this becomes a part of who you are and what you're doing, it's, you know, we're in this sharing mode of, of our lives right now where that's what we do. And so, um, and then the second part of your question, I forgot the second part. Why utilities are interested in uh, participating in this project? Yeah, so Opower, primarily Opower um, is the one dealing with the utilities, but my understanding as to why utilities are interested is because utilities are looking to expand and change their relationships with their customers. And utility, I mean, there, there's a whole other presentation that we have just about how the utility sector is really looking at social as a way to better engage with their customers because they, they're also interested in driving energy efficiency from, you know, from different demands from regulators, et cetera. And so um, I think they're really looking at just adding a dimension of how they talk to and learn from and deal with their customers and to just bring themselves into the new, you know, what's going on right now in, in technology and how people communicate with each other. In fact, um, Commissioner Sandoval from the Public Utilities Commission was just mentioning they're going to be bringing down nuclear power plants that serve San Diego and LA, and they need to do demand response during the summer, and social media is a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. So having people having that two-way flow, and there's some people who are more likely to be using something like Twitter than they would be reading their utility insert or something else. The other qu uh, question that she mentioned was languages. and. And is everything in English, or are you actually doing multiple languages? And um, I'm interested in that for all the speakers. And then we'll go back to the audience. At the moment, we're US only, and everything is in English. Um, we, we've done some Spanish implementation. We're also looking into uh, doing Korean and a few other languages soon. I believe we're mostly English today. But you know, as soon as there's an opportunity, we'll quickly uh, Translate. Well, she was saying Vietnamese, the biggest Vietnamese populations are in San Jose and LA outside of Vietnam. So I might add that one to your list. OK, uh, do you have a mic over here? Where, I don't know where the mic went. OK, there it is. Thanks. And please remember to say your name when you stand up. Thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Kara Malper. Uh, I'm a student at the uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm uh, working at NEST actually this summer. Um, uh, and uh, my question is, are there other countries or uh, just other regions in the world where uh, we could learn from, where uh, some of these implementations have been done, uh, like Europe, or um, uh, I'm just not familiar with kind of outside of California, uh, really where the kind of the startup environment is, where people are really working hard on uh, b bringing the, the whole social networking and uh, behavior change aspects of energy efficiency into play. Uh, as well as just on the more labor-intensive, you know, retrofitting uh, projects, um, just good examples from the world we can, we can have. I think one place that I would point to possibly is Australia. <clears throat> That's in part because Australia has a totally deregulated, a restructured energy market where um, everyone gets their electricity from a competitive retailer. Some of the European markets are similar, and so those retailers have to be very competitive and very much more customer attuned. Um, than in some of the U.S. markets. Um, so we have a big project with Origin Energy, which is a big retailer there. So you know, that might be a good place to look. Uh, the caveat, though, is I've recently been planning a vacation to Australia. I've been trying to do that online. And in Australia, they're, like, they're pretty bad about online stuff. So it's impossible <laughs> to make reservations and things. So I don't know that they're, they're the best in terms of being all, all wired up and, and engaged online. I'm, uh, I'm not as familiar with the, the details, but I know that the, in the Nordic countries there's been some interesting efforts, uh, particularly around submetering and, and tracking uh, behaviors. Um, I know that uh, there's a, a, one of the best databases of like individual appliance level submetered usage uh, is, is Swedish. Um, I know in the UK actually they're, they're looking to follow our lead in some ways. I know Opower just recently launched a program there. We've been talking to a bunch of utilities there. Um, so there's, there's a, a definitely a two way flow of information around these things. Speaking of submetering, what about multifamily homes and renters, which are about half the residential market? How are you addressing that? 
Um, so for us, we, we definitely try to track that, uh, both renting versus owning, as well as uh, apartments versus houses. Some of that can be gotten from property records, uh, more the apartment house rather than rent own. And we tailor the recommendations appropriately. So we're not going to tell someone to turn down their water heater temperature if they don't <laughs> live in a house, uh, or to retrofit their windows, or to do air sealing, or any of the sort of larger home retrofit things that most renters or apartment owners wouldn't have direct control over. Well, renters might have, if they're in a house, would have control over the water heater temperature. But, um, there is a larger issue in some cases with sort of principal agent dilemmas. You know, if, if a renter doesn't pay for how much they use, uh, it's a lot harder to motivate them around things like that. And in many cases, they can't even get access to programs because they don't have the utility account number. Um, and, and that's a challenge we don't have a good solution for yet. Yeah, and that, I mean, an interesting place to look over the next couple of years will be New York City, where the mayor has basically mandated that all uh, master metered residential buildings be sub metered. And that's just about to happen. And, and, and so it's too early to say how that's, you know, what companies are, or you know, kind of technologies are going to be offered to help, yeah. help people in that scenario. Because it will not be a utility project. It's going to be um, building owners that are putting those in. Yeah, and and for, the, for the app, it's connected to your bill. So it's, you know, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, if you pay the bill, that's right. the utility bill is what um, drives the O-Power social app. So if you're, if you're in a multifamily, how, how, uh, it's you, your may, bill. you may not have a bill. May, it just may be included in your rent, except for maybe. Yeah, then know, it's whoever pays the bill. Yeah. yeah. Okay. More questions in the back. Uh, yeah, no different. I'm on the faculty here at Stanford. Um, I guess I have a question about the the, the limit of the social um, the social net network uh, to achieve uh, the energy efficiency. So if we have some kind of theoretical potential gain in energy efficiency. How far can social go all the way on its own without um, without the energy provider? It's interesting that you know even even kind of on the Facebook example for social, it's still you know tied in with information from the energy provider, et cetera. Like what's so so I guess what what fraction of the potential gain in efficiency can be achieved just from grassroots social? That's a sounds like a great great uh, subject of, of some research. I, um, and the project we, we have in Cape Cod, which the, the energy provider was involved with that, certainly, but th there they, there was a 10% energy savings, and that was driven by the really the social interactions between the people in that, that community. So that's one data point. I, uh, it's, it's difficult to separate it out because there's been very few programs that are purely social. I mean, even O-Power's mailers, which are normative comparisons, still have energy saving recommendations on them. Um, for the larger space of behavior-based efficiency programs, and I actually don't really like the term behavior-based because it can be everything, uh, we found that savings for these programs tends to range from you know, about 4 to 10%, depending on the, the program and the group. Um, but they can also be, be important uh, sort of lead generation for larger and deeper, deeper retrofits, so identifying folks who would be best served with a furnace replacement and stuff like that and directing them to local contractors and, and really using that to get the 20 30% savings that uh, we need. <laughs> I think partly that's got to do with persistence, that if, if all you're changing is people taking shorter showers and turning off the lights, that's something that you have to keep working on. If you're changing the efficiency of the whole house and sealing it up and changing the furnace and automating, sensing, you're only heating or cooling when people are present and that sort of thing, you can have perm more permanent savings perhaps. So you have to kind of maybe separate out what type of savings you're getting. And there's, there's still a fair bit of low-hanging fruit that are uh, measure, sort of installation measures that are not whole home retrofits. Um, things like low flow shower heads, programmable thermostats, lighting solutions. Uh, and, and there's a lot of untapped potential in the residential market just there. Um, behavior is, is also very important, but I agree with you that getting measures that are going to last for 10 years and generate energy savings over that lifetime is, is really important. I think we have time for... Oh. We're about out of time. I don't know if we can eat a little bit of the break because we got a little bit late start, but I wanted to give each of the speakers a chance to kind of make a wrap up any point that you wanted to emphasize or a thought you want to leave the audience with. Why don't you start, Andy? Sure, yeah. I, I, I'll just emphasize again the topic that came up around access to information because um, I you know, think there's a lot of opportunity in, in social, and, but it's not happening today to a very large degree. It's happening in the context of certain projects. And where it is happening, that's because there is access to information. Because that's what really gets something to talk about, gives, you, gives people something to talk about, is um, beginning to 
clarify, put, shed some light on the black box of how people use energy? Um, I, I just like to emphasize that getting people to care about energy is hard, uh, <laughs> and we really need to be intelligent about our targeting and our messaging around that. Um, and do a, as much tests as possible, keep learning, because frankly, we don't really know that much yet, and we need to know more about how best to motivate people around these things. I'll just make a plug for the app, social.opower.com, if you haven't already signed up for it. We're actually still in beta, and so to have a group like this of you know, experts and people who actually use those six minutes and more to think about energy and energy efficiency and any feedback or um, experiences that you would have with it, we welcome. And I'd like to add that Sustainable Silicon Valley has a social um, collaboration platform for people like all of us here who are, are working in this field. And we invite you to come have this, continue this conversation about social media and energy on the EcoCloud, and that's ecocloud-sv.com. And well, we welcome you to come visit that site as well. So, thank you very much for a great conversation. Thank you.